Hi everyone, my name is Bridget Richardson. I'm the Assistant Director of Ecumenical and Pastoral Initiatives at the Nesty Center for Faith and Culture at University of St. Thomas in Houston. And I'm here today with two ladies who are gonna, we're gonna talk about uh, communication and culture and family life in the United States. So let me kick it off just by introducing them. Uh, we have Kathy Garcia Prats. Uh, she's an author, a speaker, and she's our 2020 Nesty Center for Faith and Culture Faithful Citizenship honoree. So Kathy, thanks so much for, for joining us. Well, thank you, thank you. And then we have Marian Fernandez Cueto. Uh, she's assistant professor in the communication department at University of St. Thomas in Houston. And she's an alumna of the Master of Arts in Faith and Culture program and my former classmate. <laughs> <laughs> so thank you, Marian. Thank you, this is a delight. Yeah, and I wanna let everyone know that this is just part one of three conversations that we'll be doing each month leading up to our Faithful Citizenship virtual event um, that'll be in October. So they're all gonna focus on family life in the United States. So we're very excited to get started with this first one, talking about communication and culture and how that impacts family life specifically in the United States. So our first topic is gonna to have to do with family of origin, how diverse couples are coming together to build a family together. So Marion, can you tell us how you met your husband and how your communications have styled or your communication styles have changed from your family of origin to your <laughs> current family life now? Yes, well certainly our our marriage is a coming together of, of two very different cultures in a in a third very different culture. Um, as you two know, I was born and raised in a Christian community quite similar to the Amish. Uh, up in upstate New York and Pennsylvania. And I left when I was, uh, just after I graduated high school when I turned 18 and moved to Houston and sort of encountered mainstream American culture. But for the next five years or so, I lived and worked at a shelter for battered women from Mexico and Central America. And so, even before I met my husband, I was, I was navigating several very different uh, new cultures and paradigms. Um, I then met Andres several years later. Um, he came from Mexico City from what in comparison to what I experienced was a very privileged culture and background. Um, and so as we have built a family together, we've now been married 16 years, um, it's been this wonderful sort of <laughs> adventure of all of these different influences uh, running up against each other sometimes, but also enriching each other. And we've had to learn all kinds of new ways to communicate uh, with ourselves and one another and, and the greater community. So it's been exciting. <laughs> And Marianne, what were your styles like even before? What, were, what was your communication style in your family? And then what was Andrea's communication style? You know, one thing that always stood out as a difference, um, especially in, in areas of conflict or, or in, you know, a communication encounter with two different uh, outlooks and objectives, um, was that, Andres was much more assertive and he was comfortable communicating his needs and likes and dislikes in a very straightforward way. And coming from my background, I had learned to either be subservient and not speak up or to take over in a very dominant way. And there wasn't a lot of room in between the way I had learned. And so for me, it was a, a growth experience, learning to be assertive um, without, without having a, a conflict come up, just to simply state my needs and preferences and find a way that way. I don't know if that, that helps. Yeah, and how do, you, <laughs> how do you even navigate that as a couple together? <laughs> you communicate about the communication <laughs> a lot. <laughs> yeah. And you stay curious about your differences rather than allowing them to, to alienate you. you. You say, why do you do this? And, and you know, why, why does this come naturally and not this? And you know, what was it like growing up for you when you had a conflict or a, you know, a need? Um, just learning more and more about each other, which is 
healthy for marriage as well in general. <laughs> yeah. And so Kathy, you know, same question. Tell us about how you met Joe and how your communication has changed over the years. So Joe and I met in, it was a blind date in New Orleans. So I was a uh, elementary major at Loyola University and Joe was a medical student at Tulane and a mutual friend. Uh, my best friend's sister uh, kept trying to get us to go out and uh, after several months said, why don't the two of you just go out and have a good time? Uh, we did. We did. We had a, obviously a good time. Uh, got married a, a couple years later. Joe already had finished medical school and came to Houston uh, to do a pediatric residency. And I wanted to stay at Loyola and finish up. So we, we always kind of teased. We started out on fast forward because we, I graduated on a Monday. We had rehearsal on Tuesday <laughs> and got married on that Wednesday. So we literally uh, got off to a quick start. Um, came here and yeah, we, you know, you think you're communicating and you're getting along. And then, you know, you have, you have all the day-to-day -day experiences that come into your life. Uh, we're both from different backgrounds. I'm an Irish Italian, born up in Rhode Island, but my dad was Navy, so I've lived all over the world and kind of experienced different cultures and different um, adventures. Um, Joe grew up primarily in El Paso. He's from a Mexican and Spanish family, his background. Uh, time he really left El Paso was to go to Loyola for undergrad. Um, so kind of different experiences just in, in that, that way. Um, the, um, I grew up in a family of five girls. And so we were of course chatty and sharing and um, you know, talking all the time. Uh, Joe has a brother and a sister, uh, but his, in his family, his dad dominated. And what his dad said went. So Joe always kind of teased, there was God, and then there was my dad. <laughs> and so there wasn't discussion, and there wasn't, you know, dialogue about and how to do things. It was, it was what his dad said went. Where in my family, and it was probably my poor dad, um, with all of us up against him, but we, we did have more dialogue, and we had more sharing. Um, and, and that part was very good. But on the other side, I was not, you know, you had certain emotions, say, say you were angry or you were upset with something. You really didn't learn how to express that, mm -hmm. that frustration, that anger. Um, and so you kind of kept it inside. Um, but as we know, when things like that happen, it fosters. And then eventually you do, you do let it go. Um, and so Joe and I, when we first got married, his hours were, were extremely stressful. Um, he was on, on every third night. Uh, so it meant the, the, the night he came home, he was pretty exhausted. Um, he was used to coming home and just vegging in front of the TV. Of course, I was teaching. I wanted to come home and chit chat. And so we had to kind of deal with those type of things. One of the other things we, we learned early on was um, we just had expectations, assumptions of each other that were part of our family of origin. You know, mom and dad, my mom and dad had done it one way, his mom had done it another way. And all of a sudden, you know, so I'm expecting this or assuming he will do this and vice versa. And so it was, it was kind of molding those together. And we still do that. I mean, we laugh sometimes at, at different experiences. Um, one that I like to share a lot is it was one December and my sister was ill and did to get up to visit her up in Virginia. And um, so we had gone out, Joe and I had gone out, we'd bought the Christmas tree and um, Joe had put it in the bucket on the, on the uh, to be decorated. Well, I didn't get home till maybe a few days, three or four days before Christmas. And I get there and the Christmas tree is still in the bucket <laughs> on the patio. And I look at Joe and I said, you didn't decorate the Christmas tree? And then Joe looks at me and he says, but Kathy, I know how much you love to decorate the Christmas tree. And so we both laughed. You know, it, it meant we didn't communicate, Joe should have said said, um, Kathy, do you want me to decorate the tree while you're gone? And I should have said, Joe, I don't know when I'm getting home. Why don't y'all just decorate the tree? Um, you know, 
you get those little little kinks as you go along. Um, one of the other things early on was roles and responsibilities. And I mean, Joe and I had talked about, you know, the different things that, the way we hoped things would be a little more equal than um, maybe we saw in our, in our families growing up. Um, I think especially in his, where his mom did all the domestic cleaning you know his dad would come home from work and sit in the chair um, and wait for dinner and then mom was running around after cleaning up and he did not want joe did not want that but how quickly we can we tend to get into our our patterns that we know and so it was a matter of saying you know i've worked hard all day too and i know you have but if we both clean up the kitchen um then we both have time after that. This was really a blending and learning, um, yeah, how to communicate with each other in sometimes simple ways. Um, yeah. Yeah, Kathy, I'm going to jump in here because uh, so much of what you're saying is seems pertinent to what families are experiencing right now with uh, quarantining, if they're lucky enough to be home together. Um, yeah. But they are having to encounter uh, many <laughs> expectations that, that don't always gel between uh, what roles, you know, husband and wife and kids ought to be taking to keep the house tidy and clean and, and the kids educated. Um, I keep reading, you know, articles where, where parents are articulating this struggle and um, certainly we're not immune here in our family and we've found it uh, very necessary to to up communication about that to the point where Andres and I now take we walk around the neighborhood which is about a mile if you go twice uh, every night with our dog and we just go over how it how it's going and it, it takes daily communication right now is it working that we're splitting hours like this is it working for you how we're doing meals you know asking one another um, and laughing about the day events and and finding that we can't take anything for granted. We just have to keep keep dialoguing and keep checking in with, enough, with one another. And I think that's important. You know, I one of the things that Bridget didn't didn't mention about me is that um, Joe and I have ten sons, and uh, you know, there's an 18 year span between the between the oldest and the youngest. Uh, first five were in, in six years. So we, to say the least, we were very, very busy. Um, but one of the things that I always felt was important in Joe, that that the boys become part of, of the family unit in a very direct way. Um, in other words, it wasn't, you know, people will say, Kathy, how did you do it? And I had to tell them, it wasn't a me. It was a we. It was Joe and I and the boys working together um, to make this function. Um, to expect one person to do all of something um, is some is very unrealistic. Although Joe and I are very talented or gifted in different ways. And so Joe um, is definitely going to take things with the car. If the car breaks down, I, I'm sorry. I know how to start it, stop it, put gas in the car. I am not a mechanic. Um, and there's other things that I'm stronger in. And so I tend to take on those, those responsibilities, but we work together with it. And then the boys, I mean, from an early age became part of the of the family as far as little things, putting their pajamas under their, under their pillow, um, putting their toys away, making sure, you know, certain things are, are picked up every day. Um, gradually, you know, they, they got into other responsibilities and, you know, it showed them that we were all working together. Right. You know, Joe came home, you know, he would help with whatever needed to be done. He did not sit in a chair like his dad did and it be, to do anything, you know, the resentment I think would have picked up very, very quickly. So, yeah. you know, it's it's really a, a, an important part of of our children and our and each of us as spouses um, realizing that we have to work together. And there may be days when you know I was pregnant, I was nauseated, I felt horrible. That Joe had to take on a little bit more of of the roles that needed to be taken care of at home, or you know 
he was on call and tired and I took on that. Or as we learned with the boys, the older ones often would pick up and help out with in a way that um, a lot of their friends never would have had to, um, but they did. And, you know, I always feel like they never um, resented that, that commitment to each other. So Kathy, yeah. you're touching on something really inter interesting and that's resentment. And when you, when there's a lack of communication and you do have those expectations, but you don't communicate about what those expectations are, someone could build up resentment, whether it's, you know, um, the, the husband and wife against one another or whatever. So how do you, um, in a relationship combat that resentment, like just say, oh, I don't really need to say anything. And then it, over time you get to a point where there's a breaking point, right? So, um, Marion or Kathy, how do you combat that? How do you work together in your communication so that you don't get to the point of resentment? Well, for me, early on, very early on, before we even had children, um, like I said, it was very hard for me to express some of that frustration and that anger um, because I didn't grow up with that. And, um, and Joe could tell I wasn't happy. And, you know, one day he kind of said, just please just tell me um, what's wrong. And of course, I didn't want to hurt him. You know, we're compassionate, we're kind of sensitive. Um, and I always tease that, you know, he kind of opened Pandora's box and um, because, you know, it, it became more, um, easy for me to kind of share that. Although there's still times when things happen and um, I need to process it sometimes in, in um, maybe longer than he wants or vice versa. You know, um, I may say something or, you know, say this bothered me and, and he has to process it both ways. And so we've, we've had to kind of learn to give each other sometimes that space to do that, um, but not to let hopefully the resentment build up. Um, it's hard. It's, it's, it's still hard, especially when you care for the other and you don't want to hurt them and, um, you know, make them feel bad either way. So, uh, yeah. yeah. Mary, it, is, it is hard and it, it takes, I think, a commitment to approaching conflict you know, not as a zero sum game where, where I'm going to win and you're going to lose or anything you gain is at my expense. But if we can learn and, and you know, this is uh, something we continue to practice here at home. Um, if we can learn to approach a problem as our shared problem and draw on one another's insights as a richness that we can use to solve the problem together. It can really reframe the way we're approaching it. Um, so much of conflict, just at the theoretical level even, is, is about maintaining face and, and um, staying in power or, or asserting power in a situation. And it wastes a tremendous amount of time in, in a conflict resolution. And if we can, move away from that paradigm and say, how can your insights and my insights together combine to, to overcoming this shared problem? It sounds very simple, but it actually reframes it in a very productive way in my experience. And so, you know, bringing that found down to earth and out of the classroom, that can be as simple as sitting down with my kids and saying, you know, it's not working the way our house is not staying reasonably tidy the way it needs to. Um, what ideas do you think would be good as, as we approach this together instead of, you know, here's your list of chores and here's where you're not fulfilling them. How can we together keep a tidy home? And then they, they buy in, they have some ownership and, and that feeling of power and, and face is taken care of as well. So, it's hard. Hard. <laughs> but I also think too, you know, we, we need to identify those, those areas that um, kind of are triggers, if you want to yeah. put it that way, or areas that are difficult in our culture right yeah. now. Um, I know a study out of Creighton University several years ago, I mean, it's been a long time, but it kind of talked about, you know, the, the issues of time and, yeah. and your, your careers and, um, 
you know, your, um, oh, I'm trying to think, you know, sexual issues. And there's many, many issues out there. I mean, time, I mean, we need ourselves as well as time for your spouse, time for your career. And so it's, it's how do we, how can we balance that? Like you said, you know, how are we going to keep the house clean? How are we going to balance some of, of these commitments that we have? And it was, it was hard for Joe and I early on. I mean, his, when he was in training, the hours were horrendous. Um, so when he finished his training and went into um, practice and it's, he's in the academic um, realm here in Houston. Uh, I assumed it would. I assumed it would get better, and it really didn't. And um, so then it's you know where do I fit into this? Where did Joe? Do I and the boys fit into your into your life? Um, this is really hard. I feel like a single parent, and so it was. It was. <laughs> It was us. How are we going to make this work? Yeah. And and so Joe had to reassess too. You know, what are my career goals? Right. Um, how can I make this work? Um, and so then it it became much more of a balance where I knew when he wasn't, and he learned when he wasn't on call, he had to leave and and feel confident that the doctors taking over right. would take care of things and come home, and that made it easier call and say, you know, Kathy, I'm working, I've been with this baby all, all day, I really need to stay. It was easier for me to accept that um, than it might have been if we hadn't talked about all this. It was just another night of being late and yeah. um, not being a part of the family. And so his commitment to the boys became tremendous. I yeah. mean, it was rare that one of us wasn't at one of the boys events. And people would say, how does Joe do that? Well, it's because he kind of really worked to yeah. make his career fit into us as a family. Um, and so those are, those are really important things. To respect me and my time, even though I didn't have you know, a, a full-time job outside the home, um, that what I was doing was full-time and a commitment to, to us as a family. Yeah, there's, it's, it's, it's acknowledging what those issues are and then figuring out a way to to make them work. Um, yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And we see so much of that juggling happening now just to come back to, to the pandemic. That, <laughs> you know, so many, everything's been upended, work schedules, school schedules, family home schedules, and it's a, such a new combination of challenges um, um, that everybody's encountering. And, and it, you know, the, the conflict opportunities are all over, <laughs> as are the growth and, and transformation and, and learning opportunities. So Yeah, I think there'll be a lot more respect for teachers. <laughs> yes. yes. <laughs> Going forward. Yes, and parents. Yeah. yeah. And Marion, you had touched on a little bit your work with uh, communication and conflict theory. So maybe could you share a little bit more about that and how it's changed uh, how you communicate with your family and more specifically your son? Uh, sure. I think, um, you know, just even in our conversation here, we, we tend to think of conflict as something, something negative and painful. And it indeed, it usually is. But it doesn't have to be. And, and something I've really learned and I'm growing in is this understanding that it can be transformational. Um, it can force us, which is painful, to grow in, in very new but positive ways we can uh, encounter whole whole different depths of ideas and and encounter people to, at a completely different level through conflict um, and and again I think it goes back to this idea that if we can approach a problem or a communication breakdown as as a shared issue something that we can both uh, learn from and help solve, then it, it changes the paradigm in which we're working. Um, at, a, at a very personal level, this is something my husband and I have had to learn to do with uh, one of our kids. One of our, um, my oldest son has autism. Um, he's a high functioning autistic. And, you know, learning to communicate with him um, has been a tremendous, and often painful, but very transformational journey. Um, because my go-to manner of interacting and disciplining and everything that works 
like a charm with my other kids, um, simply hits a wall there. Um, he's not neurotypical and he doesn't see the way the world we do. Um, he doesn't receive our communication the way the, our other kids would receive it. And so it's gotten easier as he's, he's a teenager uh, to communicate again about the communication. You know, when I say this, what do you hear? And um, sometimes it's really like the game of telephone. He will say, well, I hear you putting me down or I hear you something that was the farthest thing from my intention. And I will ask him when I'm, when I'm very frustrated and I need you to clean your room or when you're not um, working with the family in the way we need you to, what will communicate that best to you? And he will help me literally write down the directions that he can respond to. Um, and it's been such an eye opener for me because none of this is intuitive to me. Um, the, the ways, his ways of communicating. And it helps me see how creative and how patient and how humble we have to be in a conflict um, so that we can really grow in relationship and we can be willing to be transformed in a conflict and not simply win at someone else's expense. So that's, you know, that's a tale from the trench that that's, uh, actually been very positive in the long run for us. That's I think it, leads, it leads into the, the individuality of how we need to communicate. Yes. You know, that we communicate with each other um, in different ways. You know, how I communicate with my sisters and versus Joe or uh, colleagues. And, but then our sons. I mean, each of our sons is, is very unique. Um, that's why God made them. And they all kind of communicate in different ways. And, and how, while we have similar values and rules and things like that when they were home, um, how we had to handle each one of them was a little bit different. Um, some of them you could, you could use a little, you know, firmer voice, where others you needed to be careful how you, you um, approach them because they were very sensitive in a different way, um, you know, or to, un to understand where they were coming from. Yeah. Um, I use a, an, an example of our, our son, uh, Danny. He's our, let me think what number, he's our eighth son. <laughs> um, very, very <laughs> creative, um, li love to build, love love. And after some of his brothers had left and we had an empty room, he would take these bins of Legos and dump them into on the floor and then just build. Um, he'd be in there for hours and hours, but you literally could not get in, walk in the room. I used to tease, it's yeah. easier to walk on water than it is on Legos. <laughs> and so me being kind of a little organized and, and wanting things in its place, um, I suggested we kind of organize the Legos into different shapes or colors. And I literally thought he was going to burst into tears. And, you know, I kind of looked at him and, and said, well, Danny, and he, and he said, but mom, what fun would that be? Mm. And I thought, you know, for me, you know, I want to know where it is. For him, <laughs> it was piling through all these Legos yeah. to find just what he wanted, uh, to build what he was doing. Mm -hmm. um, just, a, I mean, I've been a mother for a long time already, but I was seeing things in a totally different way yeah. that he needed. And so instead of saying, sorry, Danny, that's the way it is. We're going to do it this way. Um, Joe and I talked and and so Joe and Danny ended up building a a box um, the length and width of the bed that was in that room put some felt on it and they dumped the Legos in there oh, and for Danny then you could slide it in and out of the room and so yeah. you know listening to his needs um, um, again no you know you could have very easily said do it my way do it my right. way the other thing that we learned with the boys, you know, we as parents too often, we, we order our kids to do things, you know, put this away, get the garbage out, wash the dishes, instead of doing it in a very respectful way. Yeah. And, you know, I always tease, you know, they still don't want to take the garbage, but it's much nicer to say, you know, um, please take the garbage out for me. It's, it's time to go. I always tease that 
it's a it's a male trait that they don't see garbage overflowing in the in the garbage cans but um but just making sure we use respectful words that we use positive terminology and not the negative um it it makes such a difference in in your reaction it is for me if someone were to say something you know negative versus positive the reaction is totally totally different and, and so often it's those closest to us and, and, and our family where we let the manners go first and, and we dispense with the, the please and thank you. And, and I tell you, it covers a multitude of sins and it, it greases the wheels of everything in a family when um, we can practice that mutual respect. I, so true. And, it's, and it is little things that make a difference in our relationships. Um, you know, we always, we did marriage prep for, gosh, almost, almost 30 years. And um, the program we had, one of the things in the early session, we would meet for, with these couples for five, five separate uh, sessions. They usually came to our home. And the first time we told them, you know, uh, we want you to list three things that you did for your fiance this week that um, made a difference and showed them that you, you cared, that you loved them. And you know, it was kind of interesting because it was like, <laughs> oh, what did I do this week? And we told them, we're gonna ask this question every week. Well, when they came the next weeks, they were simple things sometimes. It wasn't, you know, going out and buying, you know, dozens of roses and, or anything like that. They were the simple things. And how quickly we as couples and as family forget the yes. little things. The little, thank you, Joe, for making my coffee in the morning. You know, uh, him, Kathy, thank you for, for taking care of that at the bank today for me. You know, the boys, you know, thank you for picking up your brothers from school today when you got out. Those little, little words of appreciation um, go a long way. Yeah. And the negative hurt. Yeah. You know, they yeah. hurt. So, yeah. Yeah, and I think in a way we're touching on a little bit about human dignity and what both of you are illustrating and talking about is honoring the dignity of your spouse, of your children, and letting them be involved in that conversation of how the household is run, which I think is just so cool and very countercultural. <laughs> I feel like, Kathy, you mentioned ordering children around, you know, that seems to be a little bit more of the norm. So maybe yeah. you can talk about human dignity and, and recognizing the gifts of your children, of your spouse, so that your family life is cohesive and runs like a, a good, faithful and, and uh, efficient unit at the same time. You want me to start? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, you know, I do. I believe very much in that, that whole philosophy. Um, I, I, I believe that we have to love ourselves. And unfortunately yeah. in society, they will people take that as kind of that selfish love. But it's not. You know, God made me um, who I am. Um, I'm a unique individual. I have my strengths. I have my weaknesses. I have my talents, um, my gifts. Um, they're different than Joe's. And um, while we share so many values and, um, you know, ideas and, and goals, uh, we are two different, unique individuals. And so I have to love myself. I have to make sure that, that I meet my physical and emotional and spiritual, um, intellectual needs. Yeah. Um, that even though, you know, I, I'm not teaching, I wasn't teaching anymore, that I, that I didn't lose my brain. And unfortunately, when I was often introduced and, and someone says, well, what do you do? And I'd say, I'm home with the children. I could see the level of my intelligence in their eyes drop. Um, or if, but then if I said, well, you know, I'm kind of involved in this and I'm doing this, then it, you could see it go up a little bit. But, um, you know, and so making sure that I felt good about yes. keeping myself stimulated intellectually. Um, yeah. Physically, you know, I need that outlet. And so I, I would walk and, and do things um, to take care of myself. Mm -hmm. um, I was very fortunate that the parish we were in at the time opened a, an adoration chapel. Um, so after, after our fourth son was born, I spent one evening a week um, going to the chapel. And that gave me that quiet time. But it also, it, it opened up doors for me in my, um, my approach to mothering, my approach to my marriage, my approach to life. Um, yeah. You know, it just, 
totally gave me um, a different perspective on who I was, that God was walking with me, that yeah. no, I could not be perfect, that, but I could be a good mom. And so, you know, but then because I could do that for myself and acknowledge my own strengths and weaknesses, it allows you to see then the person in front of you for their strengths and their weaknesses. To look at each of our sons, I mean, some of them were intellectually gifted, but then they had to struggle a little bit socially. Or we had the son who was very socially um, capable and maybe struggled a little bit more academically. We didn't want each of them to be each other. We didn't want 10 carbon copies of each other. We wanted them to be who they are. And that's, I think, the gift, one of the, the gifts, the challenges for Joe and I um, was to acknowledge their gifts, but also it was also the gift we gave them because they began to see each other for the gifts they were and weren't trying to be the other because they knew we loved them for who they were. Um, that's, that's really important. Didn't mean they didn't have a little bit of, you know, competition. Sure. in there but there's healthy competition and there's unhealthy competition and um we we strove and they did to encourage healthy um, the older ones then were wonderful um, examples for their younger brothers on on ways to communicate and help and get along and do things in the family so um yeah kathy you're you're speaking about gifts and, and recognizing one another's gifts. And it reminds me of an um, encyclical by John Paul II that I like very much. Um, I think Bridget would be familiar with it from the program. And he speaks about how in this third millennium, we're going to need what he calls a spirituality of communion. And uh, what I think he, he means by that is, is a spirituality of relationship. And he speaks about how we will need to increasingly see one another as gifts. I, do I really receive you as a gift to me? And do I give myself as a gift to you? And do we live together in society and in the church with that perspective? Um, I mention it because I think it's, it's no coincidence that that sort of attitude is fundamental to intercultural communication and to conflict communication. Mm -hmm. um, you know, this idea that that it's together we're going to overcome these conflicts and together we're going to grow. Um, and so, you know, and the family life, like you said, just, just recognizing you and all your differences are a gift to our family and I'm a gift to you and, and communicating that way and sharing and, and approaching one another that way can really heal and transform. Um, so I, I just love that you you use that word. Yeah. And, and, and as you, you mentioned earlier, not letting our differences tear us apart, but look at as our differences as a way to build each other up. I mean, Joe and I are stronger because of our differences. Yes. If we were exactly alike, we'd have a lot of gaps around. Or, um, yeah, I mean, a lot of gaps. And so, and, yeah. and even with the boys, you know, they filled in each other's gaps. I mean, it was not uncommon for an older one to ask Danny, who's extremely creative, Danny, how would you do this? How would you see this? Um, you know, I mean, they're wonderful teachers to me with the computers and all the technology. I would be lost without them um, helping me with, with all of this, this crazy technology. You know, I used to say I had a love-hate relationship with it. Now I'm very honest, I just hate it. <laughs> There's no love love here. It's a need, and I know that, but I, I, I do not love it. Um, and so, um, yeah, we well, have to use our capacity. <laughs> our love for Zoom is plummeting. These I, know, days. No, I know, I know. But, but even culturally or or on our faith basis. I mean, I have a neighbor and we're good, good friends and she's Jewish and we both respect our traditions. We share yeah. them. Um, it's wonderful. Uh, we have people from different, different nationalities and races. And, you know, we feel like that's a gift again to our children and, and to us to have our children in a school that was extremely diverse um, was, was wonderful. It was a gift to them. 
um, never, and maybe that too, I was gifted with living around the world. And so, you know, living in Morocco and Spain and different parts of the country um, were, were wonderful. Um, yes. You know, kind of, as you said, you know, there are opportunities to grow and become more aware of, of their needs and, and our needs. Yeah. Um, you know, I'm working now in a school here in Houston, San Francisco Nativity Academy, and it's a faith-based non-tuition school in one of the poorest areas of Houston. So we're trying to outreach to this to these families. They want the same things you and I do for right. our children and our families. They just have different challenges and different yeah. demands on them, um, especially now during this this coronavirus challenges. Um, you know, they're they're in some of the lower paid jobs where they need to go to work. Um, they're they. Their English is maybe not at the standard of ours, but they want it. They want right. to learn that English, just like my immigrant parents did. My Italian parents didn't speak English when they came here, um, but they raised 10 children, and they were productive members of society. And so to look at the gifts that they have to offer us, um, right. I don't know about you, but I love the, the different cuisines from the different countries. I mean, oh my gosh. Uh, your palates, palates get <laughs> have adventures from day to day, especially in Houston. We have such a diverse, mm -hmm. diverse. Mm -hmm. And, and to, to awaken someone's understanding of their own gifts and richness is, is such a beautiful thing. Um, not just as a parent that we experience, but I, as an educator, I'm, I'm sure you've experienced the same, that when you can reach the student and, and they can see a glimpse of what you see in them and, and they say, oh, I have something very unique to contribute. And yeah. it, it changes, it changes everything for them and for the group dynamic. Yeah. Yeah, definitely. definitely. Yeah. And so how would you, uh, families who are trying to take those first steps to better communication or parents or or moms trying to figure out how can I start this, you know, this new pattern of communicating with my family, how would you encourage them and maybe counsel them a little bit to do that? Because it can be intimidating if you go from a place of, you know, right. zero communication or not very much to a place of really wanting to get in there and go deeper with your family. How would you, Marianne, maybe you could start it off. How would you help them um, think differently about things to start that? First of all, with lots of patience and humor and, and patience for oneself and others and, and a willingness to laugh in the middle of a conflict and through a conflict and just say, boy, this is hard and, and we are really trying something new here and, and none of us are going to be good at it. And, but we're gonna practice a lot. Um, just I think that that initial approach of of, of humor, humor goes a long way, and humility, um, and then just daring, daring to be vulnerable about your needs, um, daring to articulate in a, in a non-accusing way what's working, what's not for you, and in inviting solutions rather than you know dictating them um, might might be a place to start. You know, one of the uh, things. Um, you know, that, that became more obvious to, to me as I did more and more talks around the city and around the country, but was how many families don't have dinner together. Mm -hmm. And, you know, dinner is a wonderful time. It's, as I, I always tell people, it's not just a time to, to feed your body. It's a time to feed your mind and your souls and, and each other. And so it's often during dinner that experiences were shared. Yeah. Or when, when we would do um, a prayer, and we, we would say the traditional prayer before meals. And then we started asking each of us to do our own intention. You know, what would you like to pray for today? Um, you know, my dad would tease everybody. You do not get a hot meal at Kathy's house because by the time they finish their prayers, <laughs> Um, and so, but for us, Joe and I especially, it gave us an insight into sometimes where the boys were coming mm -hmm. from. Um, whether it was, you know, please, please may God help me, guide me in my decision where I'm going to college. 
Um, or it would be a prayer for a friend and you think, you know, they didn't share maybe what was wrong, but shared that there was a friend. Um, and so you, you started picking up some of the little things that were on their minds yeah. um, going forward. Um, but I also think it was important for us to, to be open enough where they would feel comfortable coming and talking to us or when something happened for for us to take them and it wasn't this this condemnation it's okay what happened you know tell us what happened and where are we going from this as, as you said where where are they in this process um how are we going to change this you know what are you going to do now um what choices do we need to make here and and so you know starting but you have to start as a unit somewhere whether it's it's a meal time or you gather once a week um we found we found dinner time was was a, a critical time mm -hmm. i also found as as a mom that um sometimes face to face is much more difficult yeah for our children yeah. um and so you know a lot of patients sometimes were in the car going to soccer practice Right. And picking up, um, you you start, you know, the conversations kind of flow a little bit sometimes when they're they're not um, face to face. Uh, yeah. Taking walks, I mean, taking yeah. a walk was was beneficial. Um, but we also found that some of the boys were more open, and others tended to keep things in a yeah. little bit more. Um, you know, so people say, oh, my sons never talk. Well, some of ours did and some of ours didn't. Yeah. Um, so, and I, I know I've shared with, with at least one of you, if not before that, you know, sometimes communication isn't just words. Yeah. Um, we remember the night that there was an issue on a movie, one of our sons going to a movie that was, um, it was a PG-13 and he was 11, it wasn't appropriate. Um, he let us know that he was not happy. He walked up the stairs and he slammed the door. Um, he was not a happy camper. Um, came back down and, and we talked. Um, yeah. And I basically, my comment to him was, you know, I, I, as your mom, am responsible for what I do and I don't do for you and the choices I make for you. Mm -hmm. And God will judge me on what I do and I don't do for you. And so I can handle your anger over God's wrath. And so, you know, it kind of eased it a little bit where there's a little chuckle in the thing and, and, he, and he accepted it. Didn't like it maybe, but he accepted it. Um, and so it is. And of course, the earlier you start, the better. Yeah. Um, it's never too late, but if you start when they're young, um, doing some of these things, praying together as a family is important. Yeah. Um, whether it's at dinner or after, uh, we gathered at the end of the day and, and said prayer together. Um, and the boys just stopped, the older ones would stop and, um, you know, and then they'd go to school and they knew their prayers and everyone thought, oh my gosh, how'd they learn them so quickly? Uh, well, they'd been saying them since they were born. So, um, but it's where we can start on some of these. So young families, if you're out there, um, you're getting ready to go into relationships. You know, it's a three-ply cord. It's Joe and I and, and our faith and our God working together to make all of this um, work. It's not just me and Joe. It's, it's our faith. And our faith is such an integral part of, of um, our family life and, and what we do and how we do it. And I just, um, in echoing that and, and the importance of, of mealtimes or sort of hard stops during the day when you can get together as a family, um, just, just wanted to send a word of encouragement to young parents. Establishing those routines can be very hard, at least for us at the beginning, meal times and nightly prayer time. It just, it was often a battle of the wills with toddlers, getting them to sit down and just be with a modicum of manners for, you know, five, 10 minutes, whatever the little moment was. And, really for years it felt just sort of when are we going to have these relaxing family conversations i hear about or when is prayer going to become this rejuvenating <laughs> time and not not just the knockdown, drag out difficulty 
Well, it happens just with patience and with love and with, you know, reasonable expectations. Um, we are now find ourselves reaping the benefit of just sticking with it. We have lovely long family meals and and lovely prayer times at the end of the day, but it it took a long time. And so don't don't despair if it's just a lot of practice for the later years. <laughs> As you said, reasonable. You do not want a toddler to be there for thirty minutes. It might just be a very simple little little time. Um, you know, right. sometimes we, yeah, our expectations are unrealistic. And yeah. so, you know, we, one of the things we always say, you know, you want realistic expectations yeah. and child, you know, what you could expect from one child may not be what you could expect from the other um, at the same age, you know, they're different. And so realizing that is, is really important. Um, yeah. How they do things. Yeah. Yeah. It's worth it. It's it worth the worth struggle. It. Oh, it is worth it. And, you know, the laughter is, is key, yeah. um, you know, to be able to, to laugh at ourselves and, and who we are and, you know, have the boys kind of join in. We tell a, a funny story because people often said, Kathy, aren't you tired? And I'd say, yeah, yeah, I'm tired <laughs> at the end of the day. And, you know, Joe and I would always try to watch the, the evening news. We didn't watch television, um, but we tried to watch the evening news. And we, we tell a funny story that it was right around the time of the Olympics. And Joe and I had sat down to watch the news and right on cue, the two of us started dozing off. Um, but I was awake to hear one of the boys tell the other, look, synchronized sleeping. And so, you know, yeah, we were tired. Um, and, and you do, you have to laugh at, yeah. at who you are, the crazy things right. you do. Um, and just remember, you know, the little things that were important when you as a couple got together um, are still important. And to, to kind of remember those, those little things. Yeah. Yeah, and Bridget, you were you were asking how do we start? You know, maybe it's just in those little nonverbal gestures. You know, my husband still brings me coffee every morning. Yeah, sixteen plus years later, just I wake up and there it is. Yeah, and, you know, it that's it. That's a wonderful way to begin the day at many levels. Yeah, and that it it again it greases the wheels of communication. That. Yeah. Yeah nonverbal sign of affection and love so maybe there and maybe just a hug yeah and as much as i said i don't like technology you know for joe to be able to text during the day and just say yeah. i love you or, or yeah. me not not interrupting him or doing anything just, you know thinking of you you know hope your day's going well sometimes those just those little those little pieces of communication yeah. um make a difference make a yeah. difference yeah well, thank you so much, Marion and Kathy, for the conversation. And there's just so many little nuggets throughout that you can hold on to and consider. And I hope people in their family lives have uh, gained some new insight and different ways to think about their spouse and their children in a way that, you know, honors their own personal um, self-affirmation of who they are and then, you know, recognition of who their children are and who their husband is as well. So thank you both for the great conversation. Thank you. Thanks, Thanks very much. Thanks.